Hello and welcome to Manny Wheel. I'll jump right back into deconstructing Bernardo Castro on monistic idealism. So, at 1 hour 24 minutes and 28 seconds. Um, reliable, uh, a robust uh, um, starting point. Now, for a physicalist, there cannot be substance behind the structure of the world. So I granted the world has structure. So I am with the physicalist there. We both admit that there is structure to the world. But the physicalist has then to proceed and say that structure is ungrounded, which is logically incoherent because structure is dependent on differences of states. If all states are identical, then there is no structure. There is just uniform goo, no structure. For there to be structure... Then, then you can't talk about states. Oh, shit. Uh, let me get back to... Uh, um, I just want to finish... I click the... I'm just going to finish... The video progression line. Damn. I hate when that happens. Mm. Hang on. Sorry about that. Now, for a physicalist, there cannot be substance behind the structure of the world. So I granted the world has structure. So I am with the physicalist there. We both admit that there is structure to the world. Um, oh, damn. What the hell, man? What am I doing? Oh. Hang on. Now, for a physicalist, there cannot be substance behind the structure of the world. So I granted the world has structure. So I am with the physicalist there. We both admit that there is... So he grants and he admits those are not really terms I like in my philosophy, right? I grant... Mm. It's sort of uh, up on high. Yes, I grant you access to next level in Dark Souls, right? And I admit to, or what, what was the term? No, I, and no, no, no. You have to give me some argument. You have to give me some structure of your thinking. You can't just say, I grant this, right? It's annoying. Structure to the world. But the physicalist has then to proceed and say that structure is ungrounded, which is logically incoherent because structure is dependent on differences of states. And what's a state? All right. So the, the, this now is another abstraction. <clears throat> so, yeah, then, then I'm, I'm going to talk about an abstraction over here. And that abstraction means this. Yeah, well, maybe you just add an abstraction where you sh shouldn't add an abstraction. And then you're drawing some conclusions from this sort of philosophical uh, straw man argument, right? Red herring or whatever it, the fuck it would be, right? I, uh... If all states are identical, then there is no structure. There is just uniform goo. Well, no then, there, then there's no states then, right? Why are you referring to states? If you're referring to states, you can't eliminate states if states are some part of your experience. It's it's just it it's it goes so quickly, uh, and I pointed out the, this a, a, a lot of times, and you're probably tired of hearing me saying it, right? In this cloud castle of abstractions, that that sort of I suppose if if um, I'm personally working from the idea that sort of let's say in the back of my mind, maybe I don't shouldn't put it that way, but in my in the, this what is described in my ontology there is somewhere there's something called i would call my reality which is sort of the story i'm telling myself about an external world based on my experiences 
it's a collection of my experiences uh, that are sort of both past experiences, past imagination, present experiences and present imaginations and predictions about the future even, right? Coalesced into some kind of picture I could call my reality or my universe or whatever, right? That, that's where the idea of universe comes from, right? There's not something I disclosed in my presentation of my ontology, you know, one step at a time, right? <laughs> but then this reality becomes a reference point for philosophizing. That reality would be the proto-ontology people like Bernardo Castro and others like him argue from when they talk about all these things. Then they then used to have theories about ontologies and metaphysics and so on, right? That would that reality in in their mind, so to say, is a proto-ontology that is sort of handed to them, I believe they think, right? And that's why he 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 feels confident juggling all these abstractions because they are they are ultimately based on some they are derived from some uh, proto ontology which is that reality I, uh, story I'm appealing to here right that's just my sort of how I would conclude the thinking is otherwise these are just terms thrown about they are not anchored in any ontology right. Not as far as I can remember. And if they are, it's so obscure. It's sort of page 97 in some paper he re wrote uh, six years ago. I can't, rem I can't juggle all that, right? Structure. For there to be structure, there has to be more than one state. And there has to be differences between states that allow us then to discern structure. Okay, but if everything is one thing, how can there be differences? So th this is also that, uh, you know, that uh, un unsolid ground he's standing on in his monist attempts to describe everything with one thing and then at the same time appeal to differences, right? I I'm not buying that because then that monist thing he's doing is just some, you know, you know backdoor way to get rid of criticism by saying, yeah, well, well, then it's different. No, no, no. It's all mind, you know. It's just various manifestations of mind, right? So there's sort of an undercurrent that is quite undefined what it actually is, other than the term mind, that can always be dragged out and say, yeah, 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 it's all mind, you know, right? But then you can talk about states and consciousness and interpersonal subjectivity and you know god knows how many terms he throws about right but states of what if you say that there is only structure well, did, this must be state of mind then right <laughs> but not the thing that takes on states in order for you to be able to talk of structure then it's like talking about movement without anything that moves. It's like talking about form without anything that takes on form. Um, in other words, you will be doing something similar to what Lewis Carroll did when he wrote of the Cheshire cat that disappears, but the cat's green. Stay, uh, green? Yeah, green or grim? But I, I don't care about this, right? This sounds to me like... You know, somebody trying to possibly straw man somebody else's argument in order to validate his own p pathetic argument, right? Yeah, those are really stupid over there. So maybe my argument is just slightly better, right? I, yes, you, I'm, you know, I'm deconstructing other people's, uh, you know, philosophy here, right? In order to point out their shortcomings. But I'm not using it to qualify my own, right? I'm not saying, therefore, 
my ontology is good because, or even apply, implying it or anything like that, right? It sounds to me like there's some, some of that in, in Bernardo Castro, where he constantly talks about the shortcomings of other people's philosophy when he talks about his own philosophy. He talks about the problems in other people's philosophy, and then in the next step, so yeah, and I have a better one, right? And I guess it can't be completely avoided, right? Because if I criticize something, I criticize it based on my own philosophy, so to say. But it's just, you know, it can very quickly become some kind of sophistry. Just just be aware of that, right? Green. Green, green, green yeah. yeah. The gets green st stays behind, which is, of course, something you can write, um, but which has no semantic content. In other words, it doesn't mean anything because a green is a configuration of the cat's mouth. If the cat disappear, disappears, um, the configuration of the cat's mouth cannot stay behind. So you can articulate this in language like Lewis Carroll did, but it's devoid of any semantic content. In other words, it doesn't mean anything. So to say that the world has structure, but it has no essence, there, there is nothing that takes on states for us to be able to speak of structure. It's like doing a Lewis Carroll and saying that uh, there is no cat, but there is a cat's green. In other words, you can say it, but it means... But uh, I would like a more cl clear uh, description of what is meant by structure from his point of view. Would it be what I describe as cognitions, right? Would it be elephant and, you know, shelf, loudspeaker, table, wall, you know, roof, and so on, right? All of my experience seems to be cognized, all aspects, all parts of it, for lack of a better term, seems to have some kind of cognition attached to it, or not attached, to, placed on it, right? Is that the structure? Because then it would be more precise to frame it as a cognition or a, a, a concept or something like that, right? Though that would be sort of screwing around with the terms, in my opinion. A cognition is what you, the actual live version of it, so to say, right? The, the human impression while thinking of an elephant is like an idea of elephant, right? In the human way to put it, right? But I'm quite fond of that human distinction because it it gets rid of uh, the, the it points out the difference between experience and an actual elephant as a cognition and thinking about the idea of an elephant, right? The idea of an elephant is not a structure, but an elephant within your in his dashboard, as he calls it, right, would be a part of that structure. I suppose he is referring to. It's absolutely nothing. It, 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 it's not coherent. It has no semantic content. And the physicalist is forced... Doesn't it? Does it, it does, I mean, if you say cat and grin, and so, that, that, that's an, there is some content, semantic content, but it, it just... It's, a, it's, a, it's not something that uh, I have ever experienced, so I, I consider it... I might consider it uh, crazy, right? If I haven't experienced something, right, then it's not a part of my, you know, understanding, right? To do that, why? Because of the history of physicalism. Um, when physicalists, before there was this ontology of physicalism, scientists... Physicalism is not an ontology. It's a metaphysics. And you, I mean, they sort of blurring the lines again, right? When, uh, when is it ontology and when is it metaphysics, right? I would say a very, very smart way of, of categorizing this would be an ontology is a description of what there is uh, with reference to how Stanford explains it or, or the defines it, right? And then if you're talking about an external world, an attempt to, to describe what there is, quote, in that external world would be metaphysics. And metaphysics, by the implications of the term, would would also entail that that ontology 
impinges, to use uh, Bernardo Castro's term, on the actual ontology. The, the metaphysics would be uh, responsible, quote, for qualia, as in, in my case here, right? On, in the presentation of my ontology, as I presented on the diagram up here, right? Otherwise, it, would be, it wouldn't be a, a physics of any kind, a metaphysics. It would just be some whatever, right? But because it's a metaphysics, it, it impinges on the physics of my ontology, right? That would be a good and clear distinction between what is meant by ontology and metaphysics, right? You could also may, maybe call it meta-ontology. Metaphysics is the thinking about an external world and the, the, the composition and the, fun, the workings of that supposed external world would be meta-ontology. You could also maybe phrase it that way, right? Uh, these are all terms that have been confused down through the centuries, in my opinion, as far as I'm concerned, right? That's why I like them to be strict and clear what is meant by it. Otherwise, I would suppose that anybody using terms without clarifying it is out to bullshit me, right? discern the structure of the world um, indirectly through the structure of perception, which is the epistemic structure we have, but we have very good reasons to think that it corresponds in some way to a non structure of reality out there, as I discussed earlier. They discern that... Oh, so an on structure to a an, an, an world out there. So now, on tic structure, so now he is talking about ontology, about an, an external world, right? So he's switching around these terms all the time. What are we do? Are we outside now? Are we inside? And is it metaphysics, ontology, or you know this this simple basic shit? He's confusing that, right? Is it because he doesn't care about it? He thinks yes. I have two PhDs, so I can just throw words at you, right? Because I'm brilliant. You just. I mean, you're just too stupid to figure this out, right? Structure. And they realized that um, it was very useful to deploy numbers and equations to describe that structure. Um, so no. You don't just start to apply numbers on things, right? This is sort of a misconception of what is done through quantification of your dashboard, so to say, right? What you do when you do science and quantify things, you take one of these aspects and compare it to another aspect, or one cognition and compare it to another cognition. Now, in order to talk with each other and plan shit with each other, it would be smart to always compare with the same standard object. Whenever I quantify distances in my dashboard, it would be smart if I use the same object to quantify other objects with. So that when I say this object is so many units of that other object, that other object is the same other object that other people are using to quantify. So when I get a number like 37, they understand the 37, but if I have one object compared to another object, and then so I talk with somebody else who compares that same object with yet another object, then the quantification I would use would be 37, but his might be 133, right? So we are sort of none the, close, none the wiser. That's why we have units, like meter, and you know liters, and so on, right? Because it says, this is the measure stick I'm using for this quantification. We are not just applying fucking numbers to it, right? Numbers and mathematical equations, mathematical structures arose as extremely useful descriptions of the contents of perception. So it's very useful for me to be able to tell the bartender whether I want a half pint or one pint of beer. So it's a number. Yeah, there it is. You say pint. You don't just say I want half. What do you want? I want half. Half what? Half pint. Ah, pint is a standardized measure stick that is comparing this beer with another beer, which is a standard called pint, 
right? That is very useful as a description of the contents of perception. And the structure of the contents of perception must... It's not a description, it's a quantification. You quantize how much there is in that object of whatever it is you want to quantize. You're not describing the beer by saying there's a pint of it, right? It doesn't... There's a pint of beer there. Okay, so now I know what beer is. No, I don't know what beer is. Yeah, I have, I have tasted beer before, but it could be something else. I have a pint of X here. So now you know what X is? No, right? So he's confused about basic shit, right? Some sense uh, uh, relate to the real structure of the real world. So those numbers end up being very useful in direct descriptions of the structure of the real world through perception. The numbers don't describe the world. It's, it's confused, right? I mean, it's, it's worrying that he is so confused about these very, very, very basic sort of scientific uh, and mathematical aspects, right? That, but he needs to say that because when he goes and says, yeah, the heart problem, there's nothing about these numbers that gives me the smell of roses. No, but it's not, you're not smelling numbers, are you, right? You're smelling the rose. <laughs> Fucking moron, man. Numbers and mathematical equations were only descriptions. But then... No. They They're not descriptions. Because descriptions are the qualia and the cognitions. What you're referring to are some kind of quantification and mathematical uh, whatever that are derived, abstracted from these qualities and cognitions, right? Because of the fight with the church, which was a very, very serious fight. You know, Bruno was burned at the stake on that account in 1600. So it, it, it was literally... Yeah, yeah, yeah. But he still loves religion and Christianity. Of course, it's so much respect for Christianity and religion, yes, he has said that on several occasions, in my opinion, as far as I remember, right? Oh, religion, yeah, and when we really dig down and he is in the right, uh, you know, congregation, he starts to talk about God and, you know, Carl Jung about, you know, uh, the Job story about, you know, God, you know, basically wiping his life out, right, and saying, yes, you have to believe in me, right? And, uh, you know, the, the, nobody expects the Spanish Inquisition and, you know, burning people at the stake. That was religious, right? But he loves religion. Oh, yes. It's so brilliant. I, uh... The life and death issue, science had to part with psyche as the ground of their activity because psyche, which is the Greek word that we translate as mind, spirit, soul, all these things, mind, consciousness, that's the Greek word. Uh, psyche, or soul, mind. Okay, so he's, he's trying to convince you that at some point, because the, the crazy bastards in the church, right, wanted to kill and burn, and you know, not just kill them, but they wanted them to be burned alive, right? So they could sit there and, ugh, you know, sadistically watch people get fried alive, right? They had to sort of say, okay, yeah, 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 okay, all that mental shit, you can keep that. We are going to study flowers and, and measure how far a long time it takes for my dog to fall from the Eiffel Tower or whatever, right? And the church would allow that, but they couldn't, they couldn't inflict, uh, they, they couldn't say anything about the, the mind control that the church was doing because that was the basic, the business they're in. They're mind controlling uh, children into subordinating to this, uh, you know, <clears throat> abusive structure, right? But that doesn't mean that they all of a sudden forgot about this mind thing, right? He's trying to sort of, uh, it's sort of a reactionary argument that, yeah, 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 at some point, three, four hundred years ago, nobody can really remember what happened. But it's something like they forgot about the mind and now they think they can, you know, they can science their way to everything, right? We just have to wind back 400 years and say, yeah, that's, all, that's actually just mind, right? It's, it's always sort of, it, it, it's this um, 
argument that you can't really get to, right? Who the fuck knows what happened for 500 years ago, right? It's, I can't check that, right? I mean, there's nobody alive who can remember the, the 19th century, right? So all, all that are, there is are, are evidence, right? And then there's no, uh, you know, first person uh, account of anything from the 19th century anymore, right? And there, are, uh, there would be very few people, I would think, unless you are sort of 130 years old, right? I think that they have died out now, right? So, so you know, let alone the, the 16th century or the, 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 the 15th century or whatever, right? You can come up with whatever shit you want, right? I t I'm not buying this, right? G give me your fucking uh, foundational philosophy and I'll, I'll, I'll deal with it, right? In spirit was the domain of the church. So for scientists not to be burned at the stake, they had to busy themselves with something other than psyche, so not to poke into the domain. Busy themselves, yes. They're just, yeah, it's, it's not like there, there's no, uh, you know, there's no empathy for people getting burned alive, right? It's like, yeah, the church just did that, so they had to busy themselves with something else than that, because they, they're just, for some reason, they didn't like to be burned, right? It sounds psychopathic to me, right? Coming up the church and end up at the stake, like Bruno did. So how to do that? Well... Let's now take those... The, the, there's no... The, there's no... And of course it was completely crazy that these people in the church were burning other people, right? No, no, there's, there's no moralizing there, right? But when you heard something on the news about some, somebody killing somebody else in Ukraine, he was like, oh my God, my, oh my, my virtue signaling, oh my God, I, ha I have to be an asshole now to, to handle this, oh my God. But, you know, the church burning people at the stake? Oh no, no, that's just sort of these weird uh, scientists who had to sort of forget about m mindfulness because, I mean... <laughs> <laughs> it's like it, 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 he's, he states it like it's just a natural process yeah if you do this you will get burned at the stake huh. Huh. whatever huh? <laughs> descriptions and instead of regarding them as mere descriptions of our epistemic structure and therefore indirectly descriptions of the ontic structure of the world no I'm not buying this argument I think that human beings are the default setting is physicalism, right? That your experiences are a direct understand. It's a direct. How would you put that? Actually, it's not a direct experience because then it's not direct, right? If it's an experience, it's not the thing itself. They think that their experiences are the things themselves. Maybe that's the best way to put it, right? With the help of Immanuel Kant, I think that's that how. Children and, and uh, but you know if if you are inflicted with this mind poison called religion from from the time you can start to walk, of course you are sort of concerned about these mental aspects because you have been inflicted with this poison from your childhood and onwards, right? But people living in the state of nature don't care about my uh, you know sky ghosts and so on and and mind beyond mind and whatever right they're just trying to find the mushrooms and the potatoes and the strawberries and the rabbits and so on right let's say that they are something other than psyche let's say that those descriptions are the thing in itself in other words instead of descriptions the numbers are now the real reality the thing described <laughs> instead no. of straw man argument Understanding the numbers as the map that describes the territory, we started taking the numbers for the territory. We started to take the map as no. the territory. No, it's not the numbers, right? It's the cognitions that are understood as being an outside world, right? In my opinion. 
It's not the numbers, right? That, I think, is a straw man to make it e sound even more crazy that it's, it's numbers that becomes the smell of roses, right? It's to, to make it even more sounding even more crazy. Of course, it's crazy to say that your experiences are outside your experience. I get that. And I, I would agree that, well, uh, that it's crazy, right? But that doesn't mean that that experience they're referring to is numbers. Are quantifications? No, right? You don't need to count an elephant in order to say that elephant is outside myself, right? You don't need to count it and measure it or whatever or compare it to a, a you know, a, a, a rock or whatever, right? It's a it's a straw man to talk about these numbers at, as that which is the outside world from a physicalist standpoint. I don't buy that, right? This is a straw man argument, in my opinion. Um, and pretending to ourselves that we can pull the territory out of the map. That's, what, that's physicalism. Physicalism says that out there, there are only the mathematical equations and the numbers and the quantities. They were descriptions in the early days. Now they are the world. They are the real ontic structure of the world behind perception. And it's necessary for physicalism because if you don't do that, then the only alternative is that uh, those equations are descriptions of something else, and that something else can only be psyche, can only be mind, um, mental processes, because mathematics exists in mind. So unless you say mathematics is pure abstraction, then if there is mathematics out there, then there is a mind out there, because that's where mathematics uh, is done. Mathematics reflects the archetypal structure of mentation. Um, what? So that's the history of physicalism. The archetypal? What? Structure of mentation? Uh, oh. <laughs> Yet another description of what's going on in that mental shit of his, right? So now the archetypes, what, what are those? Is that also cognitions you're talking about there, right? How, how many terms have you been using through the years to describe that mental world of yours, right? It doesn't seem like there's just one thing, right? With all these terms floating around and all these variations and ripples here and this there and, and you know, I'm not buying it, right? Because it, when you really drill down in, into this, right? If you are monist, you are saying there is only one and that is mind. Done. No more, right? If you start to qualify various aspects of that which you call mind, then you are subdividing that thing you call the one thing. Then that one thing is not foundational if you can subdivide it, right? If you can reduce it to smaller parts. He's a reduction fan, right? So if you think everything is mind, then you should stop there, right? And go be happy, right? And be happy that you're not going to get burnt at the stake, right? But he starts to subdivide it into various shit, right? So mind cannot be fundamental, right? You can't, get, you can't, have, can't have your cake and eat it too, right? The problem is that the numbers... Sorry for this long-winded response. I'll, I'll get there. Oh, no me. problem. Yeah, take your time. <laughs> Stay with me. The numbers... Oh, you just speak my leash. My leash. <laughs> and the mathematical equations, because they originated as descriptions of something else. It's, it, it, these, it, please take note, right? These guys have been trained to shut the fuck up when the masters are speaking, right? They're sort of congregation mentality. When the priest is speaking, you shut the fuck up and listen, right? And wait until spoken to, right? This is not a discussion. This is an, an audience. What, what's it called when you, when, you have, when you go to church and sit there on your bench and do as you're told, right? And listen to the master in the bucket up there, right? This is the mentality of these people. This is a church. This is not philosophy, right? These are ch abused children. 
who can't let go of, of what mommy inflicted on them, right? They have to combine all this. It's uh, just to mention something else. I, I saw the um, the latest uh, uh, Hyao uh, Miyazaki movie. Uh, he's a famous Japanese uh, animator, right? With a, f a lot of, you know, a groundbreaking animation, uh, old school animation, drawn animation, right? Uh, the, the latest movie is The Boy and the Heron. And... The, the Boy and the Heron is interesting, uh, though I, I'm a little disappointed about the storytelling in it. But maybe there's a point about how it's, the story is told in this movie. And I watched it with my daughter. She's, very, she's a big fan of Studio Ghibli right? and, and Miyazaki. And what he tried to do in this movie, he's 80 years old, or even more now. He's very old, right? So it's possibly more, likely his last movie, though he, he'll never stop, right? But... This, he, it's, it looks to me like someone trying to fit the pieces together in a story that is inherently fractured. There are some pieces missing in his life story because it's very much about himself, though it's very abstract in that sense, right? But he has said it's a part of a self-biographical -bio movie, right? To some extent, though it's based also on a book. That is a favorite of him is that he got from his mother way back in the 50s, the 40s, right? So it's like somebody trying to fit the pieces together. But these pieces are a, a big cauldron or a, 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 a gumbo of experiences and stories and religions and and. Uh, good and bad and, you know, everything. That's why I think this story about the boy and the heron is so, I wouldn't say incoherent, but it's it's a mixed bag of all sorts of shit he tries to tie together, right? And then his, you know, his big mentor died during the making of this last movie. And he has a place in the movie also, obviously, right? He's sort of a, his father figure maybe, right? So in the same way I have with Bernardo Castro and his ilk, right, is that they're trying to piece this tapestry of bullshit and philosophy and religion and woo-woo shit and, and science to some kind of attempt at a coherent story that brings things together that he wants to be there, right? There are certain things, as particular aspects of his being and his life and his understanding of himself or something, he can never let go, apparently, I would say, right? So it has to be there, right? So he, he circumvents various aspects he cannot argue for rigidly in philosophy. Then he'll attempt to use science, or he will attempt to use some woo-woo, or he will attempt to, use, attempt to use religion, whatever it takes to get from A to B to C to D and so on, right? And that's why I'm concerned. I'm concerned about this, and I think this way because he keeps conflating and equating terms. He talks about a world, and then the next minute it's called nature, and in the next minute it's called mind at large, and in the next minute it's called pure subjectivity, and the next minute it's called this that. It's all over the place, man, right? depending on what kind of mentality is in at the moment, right? I mean, maybe he's a fucking dissociated identity disorder. He's had a seven different personalities, right? Their meaning is grounded only something else, just like the lines on a map. The meaning of the lines on a map uh, is grounded on the actual structures of the territory. So if you see a mountain on a map... okay. So if you see a, a line on a map, there is a line out there. So if I go to France, I could say, hey, look, there's a line on the ground there or in the sky or whatever, right? This is the France line. No, no, it doesn't. It's all imaginary, right? With those little lines close to each other, the meaning of the lines close to each other is... Yeah, the meaning of it, the line... It's an abstract meaning. It's an imaginary meaning. 
It's a convention of how to represent something that it not actually. There are no lines out there, right? It's it's the it's the different. It's a diff, He's um, if if I draw a line to represent something, then there has to be a line out there I'm re representing. But if there isn't a line out there, then that is not a map that represents reality. Then it's an, an abstraction to represent it, right? There is a, a mountain with a sharp ascending side, a, 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 a steep mountain. Um, and th that's the meaning of those lines close together in the map, because those lines are descriptions of this mountain with steep uh, sides. But if you now say the map precedes the territory, now you are robbing the meaning of those signs. Because their meaning was the thing that was described. But if you now say... Yeah, but I under, you keep pounding this. I think people understand the, the, the switch of, of physicalism and the, the map and the territory problem. I think people understand that. I, maybe I'm, I'm you know, setting the, the standards too high. I don't know. But he keeps pounding the same problem. It's sort of a loose track. Is he still talking about this problem? It's, you know, one and a half hour into this? Um, okay, whatever, right? But if I had a topographical atlas, I think it's called, where you can see these lines about, you know, valleys and peaks on, on, in, the, so in the supposed landscape it describes. If you took that and showed to somebody on the African savanna who's never seen it before, they would say, what the fuck is that, right? But if you showed them a photograph of a hill, I suppose they would understand this looks like a hill, right? I, it's it's an abstract representation with some built-in understandings of potential measurement that is represented uh, according to some standards of measurement, right? So it's more it's a more abstract at least representation. So be careful with these analogies he's making. Just be careful, right? And I have to shove some. Say the map oh, well, precedes the thing described. Now the reference for that meaning is lost. Because the reference is not something that comes out of the map. So it cannot ground the meaning of the map. Same thing for the numbers and the mathematical equations. The moment you say these are no longer mere descriptions, now these are the world. Now the meaning of those numbers and those equations has disappeared. Because the equations now have to precede the thing that grounded their meaning, their meaning to begin with. So what was the meaning of 50 kilograms? Well, the meaning of 50 kilograms was my experience of lifting a piece of luggage that weighed 50 kilograms. Or watching a 50 kilograms weight fall within a viscous liquid. Or, weigh, or, or, or perceiving, experiencing the movement of the needle of a balance when I put a 50 kilogram piece of luggage on it. In other words, the meaning of 50 kilograms was experience of one sort of a, or another. The meaning of uh, uh, mathematical equations are the experiences that grounded them to begin with, or the experiences that are, that are predicted by those mathematical equations. If I predict the movement of... no. I understand what he's trying to say, but I think he's reframing the problem. He's trying to make it sound like physicalists, and maybe some advanced physicalist scientists are actually doing this. I, can, I won't rule that out. But the foundational sort of normy approach to this is not numbers, right? It's not like they think they're going to look for numbers down at the grocery store and expect to get tomatoes, right? They look for tomatoes to get tomatoes, but they think that that tomato they're experiencing is actually outside their own experience. That's the why the hard problem arises, right? It's not because they're looking for numbers, man, right? He's living in this academic uh, hard-on collider universe, right? So he's all interpreting, I think, what, what is actually going on in, in every in sort of a normy kind of uh, environment, right? of an object with a Newtonian equation, what's the meaning of the symbols and that equation as a whole? Well, the meaning is the experience I will have when nature 
plays itself out as predicted by the equation. But if now physicality precedes mentation, then you rob those equations of their meaning. And that's, that is the hard problem. Oh, you're a robber. We cannot infer the qualities of experience from physical parameters because physical parameters are purely quantitative and their meaning is... Yeah, they're quantitative. There you said it. But what is it that is being quantized? You're appealing to the numbers, uh, a result of some quantification. But what is being quantized are actually the cognitions. And those cognitions is what people are looking for. That's why it's a cornerstone of my ontology, right? Or, or the, the, the things I'm describing, the, the experience I'm describing, the phenomena I'm describing in my ontology. Because it's actually the cognitions that are the center po centerpiece of this is now lost because they must precede the experiences that gave them meaning. So you cannot deduce anything from them, ergo the hard problem. In other words, it's not a problem. <clears throat> it's an internal inco inconsistency in the line of thought, which says that the description precedes the thing described. By yeah, doing sure. that, you rob the descriptions of their meaning and therefore nothing. But don't overrepresent what, what, how they go wrong about it, right? I think he's doing that. Sort of why I call it a straw man, right? And, and, you know, a, a straw man always helps, you know, if you, if, when you're straw manning shit, it's because I think in the incentive to make your own argument look better without actually having to do the argument, but you're representing somebody else's argument as, as more stupid than it actually is, right? Or creating a different argument, which is a straw, you put up this straw man and say, hey, that's the argument over there. Don't look at the actual argument. Look at that argument I've just created, right? Nothing can be deduced in principle from them. Nothing can be deduced a priori from them. This is the history of physicalism. And now, finally, the reason why I'm saying this, that's why Keith Frankish needs to deny that there is essence grounding the structure of nature, because he has to be... Essence grounding the structure of nature. So nature, is that an external world? Okay. All these terms floating around in his mind, apparently, right? That he tries to express, are confusing what he's talking about when he talks about it, right? When he mentioned them. Are we talking about an imagined external world? Or some essence underlying an imagined external world? Or is some of that essence a part of my, because it's all mind, you know, right? So it's also a part of my experience. And it's sort of everything instead of, it just got up in, in, in a cloud of smoke of, of words, right? And I'm not trusting any of the, of the shit, right? Consistent with the notion that the description precedes the thing described. And therefore, it has to have no reference of meaning. It cannot have any essence. It cannot have any grounding substance. Because that is the movement that was made in the early days to define physicalism as something that wasn't psyche-related, wasn't mind-related. And you have to say that uh, there is just pure abstraction. That the I think, I just come to think of it, it's a little, a little uh, it's an tangent here, right? But what, what I think that people, they argue usually from their emotions, right? When, when there, there have been made some studies, and, and I'm not you know, an expert in this, but, but there have been made studies that people are more concerned about how you present yourself in an argument than the actual argument. If you look nice and say it nicely, you can get basically a, a, a away with anything. You, you can bullshit people left and right. If you have the right suit on and you have the right sound of your voice and you look nice or uh, whatever right they're going to buy anything but if you don't look nice or you say it in a particular way they don't like you can have the best argument in the world and they're not going to believe you right so they work from an emotional standpoint and i think that to with this emotional standpoint in mind if if you are you have this the science approach and the mind approach, right? The science seems sort of cold, calculated, just numbers as he's trying to allude to here, right? And it will never get to the mind by, well, your real experience of love and harmony and bliss and, 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 you know, all that good shit, right? 
It's just measuring a numbers, right? It's so boring and, and cold and calculated. And there's also capitalism and all that over there, right? But this is like communism and collective illusions and, and feel good and love, right? Over here in the mind. Sort of, it's like, oh, no, I don't want that cold calculated, you know, number shit. I want feel good mommy over here, right? I think that's, if that's what woo woo people and idealist people appeal to, they appeal to this come over to our, it's just kumbaya holding hands and, you know, burning the midnight oil, right? Oh my God, sis. The structure of nature is purely abstract. There is nothing ground in it. There is no essence. There is, there is no substance. There is only the mathematics. There was a physicist who wrote a book about it called Our Mathematical Universe yeah, by uh, the Swedish physicist. Max um, Stegmark, I think. Max Stegmark, yeah. Of course, the reality of it is, is plain to see to any non-specialized but educated person, which is, if there is only mathematics, what we mean by this is that there is only a mind, because mathematics only exists in mind. Where else is mathematics? Point mathematics to me. Give mathematics to me. Put it in my hands. No, <laughs> mathematics is, a, is a, 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 a essentially mental process. Um, but uh, the limited well where point me to mind where is it point but point where where is it right <laughs> where is consciousness point point to hand it to me right uh, no but it's everything therefore i can hand it to you oh hey woo woo right activists cannot grant that because they're trying to deny the very thing that grounds mathematics which is mind they're denying that they're denying mind they're denying consciousness so you have to have empty structure, which is incoherent. It's as incoherent as talking about movement while denying anything. Okay, I, I think you have, you have, you know, rest your case, man, right? Okay. That moves. It's as incoherent as talking about the, the permanence of the Cheshire cat's green when the cat has disappeared. It's as incoherent as talking about spin without the top that spins. Yeah, but however much problems you can identify in physicalism <coughs> and, and, and it's, it's subordinate, like illusionism and so on, doesn't mean that your philosophy is correct or better or anything like that. That would be a, a, a fallacious uh, understanding, right? Just because it's slightly better doesn't make it a good philosophy, right? I mean, and it, it, it's just an appeal to... It's like finding flaws in, in, the, in the competing car salesman across the road and say, yeah, look at those cars over there, right? That wheel is not correct. That has a bad color. And then this, uh, there's a, you know, a, a, a bump in, 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 the, in the hood of that car. Look at the bad cars over there. So you should buy one of my cars. It's like, no, that doesn't follow, right? You see, it, uh, um, it, it is incoherent, but the physicalist, especially the eliminativist, the illusionist, is forced into that incoherence because of the movement that took the numbers and the mathematical equations instead of descriptions of something, transferred them to the foundations of reality and say the description precedes the world described. So they have to maintain the consistency with that incoherence, which only leads to more incoherence. It's unavoidable. Absolutely. And I think you dropped a very uh, important clue a while back about behaviorism and about the age of the eliminativist. It's, it's not a coincidence, actually. Um, I don't mean that as an insult, but it's true back in those days. It's true. Like in the okay, 50s so and stuff, knows behaviorism. About, knows about truth, right? Without defining what he means by true, right? True is one of those terms that are just thrown around, right? Objectivity and true and knowledge the, and morality for that matter, right? Ethics. It's just thrown around like, bleh, right? Okay, so the next timestamp would be um, uh, scientism and materialism. So I think it's the sort of the same ballpark still, right? But let me, let me take that one in the next part. And all I have to say now is, you know, have a nice day. See you there.